example. And then I'll let them do their own introduction. Each um, person up here is going to speak for about five minutes. Uh, and then I have a couple questions, but then I want a lot of the questions to come from you guys. Um, so think about posture. Posture. It's important. Okay. <laughs> All right, so wait on there. We have Eli Gokta, who's one of the co-founders of Groundswell, uh, an instructor and mentor, super active. Um, his background in alternative education and, enterprise and all sorts of stuff internationally. Uh, Curtis Rattray is from the Tuckland Nation, which is a 25 hour drive up north. 20. 20? <laughs> you drive faster. <laughs> 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 Unless you drive like a pussy. <laughs> 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 or stop lots. <laughs> 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 uh, I gotta pee again. <laughs> it was definitely the fences in the car. Yeah. Um, so he leads uh, youth leadership uh, expeditions in the wild, as well as uh, having a guiding business um, up in the beautiful, beautiful uh, landscape up there, which you just saw in the movie that he uh, co-starred. Can I say that even in the documentary? Yeah. <laughs> and he just mentored our first team. Yes. And uh, he's here for three days to work with and mentor uh, a new youth program that we're starting building small businesses with actually going to the cafe staff who were like, I want to do this. Uh, within the cafe, so that's they made all the food. Awesome. Made, so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my give is leading that youth program. Uh, she, I think you're going to talk about your background a little bit. So she just joined the team a few months ago, and you'll hear more from all of them. And David LePage is our what was it today? The most famous person in social media. <laughs> Someone wanted to do a favor for them, so. You got called the most how, famous how do you get a meeting with someone you don't know and you start emails and says, I know you're the most famous social entrepreneur. Will you meet with me? Thank you. So he's been working uh, with us for a full year, two cohorts, um, developing curriculum and leading uh, the real hands on business building part of everything. So maybe I'll start with you, David. Awesome. We do this. We do this. Okay. And there's a microphone up there. It should be okay. Is the, is the sound sound weird? Sound good? Yes. Okay. I didn't say anything. I already got thumbs up. Oh, that was the sound. <laughs> 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 So I thought it was great because on the poster for um, tonight's event, I was described as the senior advisor. And I am. I'm like the oldest guy in the room. That's how, you be, it's how you get to be a senior advisor is just do it long enough. And then you get to be a senior. And to go back to how I got started in working in social enterprise, it actually goes back a long time ago when I grew up in a very white, very privileged community in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And it was during the 60s when I graduated from college. And if you became a conscious objector and said, I don't go to war, you had to go do social work for two years. So my first job out of university was being a janitor in a community center and working in the inner city in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. One of our big problems was that people were trying to destroyed the neighborhood had all kinds of beautiful printing things. Now, some of you may not know, but there was a time there were no emails, no computers, <laughs> printed things to communicate. Wow, so I know. <laughs> and so government and the city had beautiful printing to get their message out. And we said, how are we going to get our message out from the community? And my brother and a friend of his said, well, we're printers. And we said, okay, let's go get a grant to do some printing. And so we went to this little foundation. We said, we need $2,000 to do printing. And they said, are you going to get some printing done at the print shop? We said, no, we're going to start our own print shop. So we actually started a community-owned print shop and ran our own business. Because the way we could be more effective was using a business model to create social change as opposed to being dependent upon an economy that didn't support the community. So over the years, I became much more involved in different types of social enterprises, community radio, 
And then about 15, 16 years ago when I moved to Canada, started working in the downtown east side. And that was one of the first things that when we started, I was one of the two people to start Inverse, was the whole idea was that without some kind of employment, without some kind of economy that was based on the principle of building opportunities for people in the neighborhood, built on a community economic development principles, we weren't going to have any economy because the economy was escaping. So the idea that I've always worked with is that the problem is, is that business somehow got way off track. And the idea that trading things between each other doesn't have a social value, only an economic value. So my whole purpose of working with Brownsville and the things I do across the country and internationally is how do we build a social value marketplace? And to me, to build a social value marketplace, we've got to begin by building businesses that put that into their core purpose. So that's why I really believe in the idea of social enterprise. A social enterprise that built on really values, values that reflect community ownership, the investment of capital in the community, and creating defined and measurable social or economic or environmental purpose. And so when we look at things like in the downtown east side, we look at like the fire hall theater, bringing arts to the community for the last over 25 years, when many people never wanted to come to the neighborhood, they were doing arts and culture in the neighborhood. Cafe, when it started in the year 2000, people thought, who's going to start a business on Hastings Street in 2001? And 15 or 16 years later, it's still a thriving business. But when we started Embers, people were like, why would you start a community economic development corporation in this neighborhood? When we understood the power of business when used in the right way, because people do trade things. We all need to work together and trade value trade goods and trade services. But if we do it to build community, we set it to extract value, we actually create healthy community. So that's why I get involved in social enterprise.
anyway, so... Lucky we, that you have emails. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I chased my business for a long time. And, um, but what I, one of the things that was really exciting for me was um, watching people come uh, and apply for work. Because uh, cleaning is, you know, pretty much the crappiest job you can do. And, um, it was women who were coming. It was women who were new to the country. It was women who were in transition, women coming out of something and needing to get to another place. And it was always like a really low self-esteem kind of place they'd gotten to, to apply for a cleaning job. And I was like, what, what is this? You know, what is this? That, that um, because of one of my beliefs is that it's a human right that your work be meaningful. And that applies to people who clean houses too. So we, uh, started like I co-created this concept with the with the women who showed up to, to clean houses with me, and um, and we decided we're not maids, we're divas, um, and uh, we had power aprons, and we had bike like, trailers, and we looked super hot, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we went into people's homes not as maids but as health practitioners, and we were there to advise people how to create balance in their space and the health in their space. And we learned feng shui, we learned um, aromatherapy, we, and we really changed the power dynamic. And the coolest thing was like we brought our customers on site with us. So they were part of that relationship, you know, and, uh, and we fired customers who didn't get that and thought we were mates because it was like, diva. <laughs> So I think that that's the, the thing is that, and once those elements were in place, the transformations that started happening um, to myself and to the women that I worked with was really something because you could start to think of yourself outside of, I'm a broken person who has nothing to offer, who uh, is only here to make someone else money um, and to do you know, what nobody else is willing to do and to you know, a different concept of yourself. So that's, that's the reason why I think social enterprise is powerful. Lake, and I've been. Uh, well, I'm finished right now with uh, with Groundswell, and this is my last event with them this week. So I'm actually heading back home on Saturday. Um, a quick background about who I am and where I'm from. Um, so I live in Dees Lake, about 20 hours drive here. 25. Here. <laughs> and, um, it's 2,000 kilometers. You do the math. <laughs> um, it, we're 250 kilometers south of the Yukon border and about 250, 300 kilometers east of the Alaska Panhandle. Who's been to Beast Lake? <laughs> Who knows where Beast Lake is? In my imagination, I've been there. <laughs> All right, so a couple of people right on. Um, I have this thing when I was in the Army. I, was, I grew up in Fort St. John, and when I joined the Army, everybody's going, what's your name, where are you from? And I go, Fort St. John, and they go, where's that? So I explain it to them. I said, where are you from? They go, Toronto. I go, where's that? <laughs> you never heard of Toronto? No. Um, so I had, I had fun with those guys. Um, so then I tried to explain to them. Good thing I didn't come from Beast Lake, eh? <laughs> and those days. Um, after I got out of the Army, I actually moved back. Um, I moved to Beast Lake to go live with my grandmother in, in the movie that we made it. And that's a true story. I went back to cut firewood for her um, in that summer. and then. That fall, I was going to go look for a college to go to, right? And um, anyway, the, we spent the whole summer at fish camp, and I didn't have a chance to get cut any firewood, so I thought I'd just spend the fall there and cut firewood. So I've been there ever since. Um, so some of the stuff that I've been, I've been involved in was uh, it was about two years after uh, I moved to Deast Lake, I got elected in as a vice president of the Taltan Central Council. Um, and the Central Council is the, the political body for the Taltan Nation to represent the Taltan Nation for our outstanding Aboriginal rights and title plan. So that's what my job was. And we had a lot of uh, infighting and division right after that. I got elected in, about eight months later, the president resigned and I was president based on our constitution. And so that was quite a learning experience for me. But, so anyway, I got some political background. I ended up going to UVic and got a degree in political science and environmental studies. After that, I got back into politics because one shit kicking wasn't enough for me, I guess. 
<laughs> and downtowns are pretty tough people, you know, hard to please. Anyway, so uh, I did that for, I did about nine terms all together as a spokesperson for the Taltan Nation. An incredible learning experience. So I got to meet with ministers and, and uh, high-ranking officials of, of resource development companies, so that was quite interesting. Anyway, so two paths for me. I'm here to speak about Aboriginal perspectives and entrepreneurship, and so I thought I'll talk about my own personal experience with my own business versus our development corporation. But um, I ended up, two paths to ended up starting my own business. One is um, employment. I got, I didn't really like working for other people. And um, so that was one of the reasons. And, and I'm still doing okay because I haven't fired myself yet. So, <laughs> um, And then the other reason is is about um, the Taltan Nation. So what I did is I tried through political means to rebuild the Taltan Nation. And that didn't go very well. And then I tried through social development and was on the board of Taltan Health and Social Service Authority. And that didn't go well. Um, too much conflict of interest, that's another story. But um, anyway, I, I thought the way to do it was through leadership development and focusing on youth and the next generation of leaders. And so that became my focus. And, um, and one of the reasons why I, I went in the direction of, of starting my own business. Um, so the cultural values, actually let me talk about my belief systems around um, that humanity, we're not in an environmental crisis. I think we've been misled. I think we're in a social crisis. For me, the environmental crisis is evidence that we're in a social crisis. And I really got to thinking like that because of the war in Iraq. And as a soldier, I couldn't believe how easy we were convinced to go and bomb the shit out of somebody, right? So I thought, there's something wrong here. But I've always been thinking along those lines anyway because I've been doing a lot of research around colonization. And and the conclusion that I've come to is everybody's been colonized. At some point in time, down your genealogy, your people have been colonized. Some of us have been a little more recent than others, but that's the history. And then there's also social impacts, as modern day social impacts as a result of the colonized and the colonizer, right? That type of process affects everybody, right? So that's my line of thinking. And, and I see that kind of impacts in our communities all the time. As a political leader, we had to address, address it. As a leader in, in social development, we needed to try to address it. But the capacity there is really, really lacking. And then if you look at Canada, I mean, the, the capacity there is lacking also. But. So anyway, um, so I got an instruction to start my own business. I do backpacking guided tours. I do um, capacity building for First Nations. And I do leadership and what I call WILD. Holistic Indigenous Leadership Development. And I noticed we spelled holistic with a H with First Nations. It's, it's well, we, the yeah, first, well, my English is not very well. <laughs> but, but, but if you go into the dictionary, that's how it's spelled. But if you look at the meaning, it's quite a bit different. So one of the things that I was involved in was the Keen Holistic Working Group, and we had a discussion about the spelling of holistic. And everybody agreed there's Casca, Tlinka, and Talton, and we all agreed holistic should be spelled with a W. Like whole, the word whole, right? The, with the W, the whole, the, the whole with the H is the whole in the world. And we're going, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to make a holistic, um, <laughs> a holistic a, a solution, right? So that's why I use WAM. I thought, well, this is great. Originally, the, the acronym I was using was COLD. Corporate Outdoor Leadership Development. <laughs> and I thought, no, that's not going to work. I love acronyms, by the way. Um, so some of the cultural values that I put in there is being on the land, respect for the land, um, and maintaining my uh, relationship on the land. And so those are the values that that I'm um, that I'm trying to maintain while while for my with my business, um, and seek out spiritual guides while I'm out on the land. And so the you'll n notice that if you're out there long enough, you'll start to sense and appreciate the spirit on the land. And that's how Native people name places, is based on that spirit and that characteristic of that place, and not after some explorer. 
um, <laughs> or some human that's been there for the first time or supposedly been there for the first time. And then the other thing is to strengthen my role. So those are the, some of the cultural values that I, that I maintain, maintain for myself as part of my business. And the other one, main one is sharing. So it's about sharing uh, tel -ten knowledge. Um, so that's one of the unique things that I offer is the tel -ten stories, the culture, the place names, transformation stories, or story, what I call stories of creation, respect, and kinship. Um, and cultural experiences, tel -ten cultural experiences on the land. That's the other thing. And finally, it is about the, the beauty. I want to share the beauty and the spiritual values of tel -ten land. And so sometimes we have spiritual encounters with animals on the land, for example. Um, oh yeah, while I was sitting here waiting, I had come up with my, one of my new uh, concepts in my business, decolonizing Canadians one backpacker at a time. <laughs> uh, my name is Gila, I came from Tel Aviv, Israel five years ago. Uh, my long story short, uh, I'm dyslectic and I caught reading and writing in my mother tongue when I was in fourth grade. And kicked out of high school when I was in ninth grade. And became the youngest principal uh, in Israel when I was 26. Um, Create my first business when I was 21st, 21. <laughs> uh, 21 and um, I went to university very late in life and then become an academic. Uh, I designed bachelor and master degree in alternative education. And I was the CEO of IDE, the Institute for Democratic Education, is a big institute that uh, creates lots of alternative schools. Uh, and my perspective on this talk today is about why education change everything because smarter people than me said that if you want to change the world you need to change the education because the education system created or prepared us to accept the, the social order that we live in. And it's very easy to showcase it with the, to showcase it in, with this education system that we have all over the place and I had the privilege to travel in schools all over the world and to see the same thing uh, with different people and different languages happen again and again and again. Uh, and I'm going to describe it in a very short time and then I'm going to describe the alternative to that. Uh, basically, it's the statistics that starting in the very early 19th century uh, influence our culture. And it's influenced the, the debate about around education. Uh, and basically, basic statistic, I'm going to give, you a, a, give out a secret. It's, it's all about the bell curve. So if I got a random uh, thousand people in Vancouver, and I'm going to ask random thousand uh, people in Vancouver to run 20 miles, I know the results before we start, because 20% of us are going to be great. 20% are going to quit with me after five miles. It's taken me 25 hours to get to this week. <laughs> Just assuming me running 20 miles. And 60% are going to be mediocre. Uh, you know, some okay mediocre, some oh, and some almost fail mediocre. And if we're going to do a, a random 1,000 people singing competition, we're going to have the same results. 20% going to sing wonderful. 20%, you know, we're going to join from their behalf. We have television shows of that, and 60% we're going to send them to sit in the shower. And, and, and this is whatever you do, you're going to get the same as you're going to get in the classroom. So before you get to the, before you go to, to school, the teacher has been taught that for years. They need to, they need to uh, identify the bell curves in the classroom. And professors in university, and I was one, till today, need to give scores in the shape of bell curve. This is how the system works. So when you try to improve something, if you improve some mediocre student, someone will become, and you make it better, someone will become mediocre. This is the system that we work in. And it's happened every time that you measure random big amount of people in the same measurement, and you create a competition. You know the results before the competition starts. 
And this kind of shape really serving well pyramid shape of society. Because the hidden curriculum, this is the most important part of the curriculum, because different curriculums everywhere, but the hidden curriculum is the same. And the hidden curriculum is about shaping your self-esteem. So if you, in school, in the 20% that succeeding great, you start to feel that you deserve everything. So you deserve that some people clean your house, and some people wash your cars. And, and if you're in the 60%, the mid mediocre, like most of us there, you start to have uh, little dreams, you know, about a very mediocre life with a mediocre partner in a mediocre house with mediocre kids and a mediocre career. And this is basically what you prepare yourself for. And if you're a failure, uh, you know the rest of the story. And some of the uh, failures become really great entrepreneurs just because, you know, uh, when they kick me out of school, I had to think out of the box because I had no box to think from. So some people get the advantage of that, but some other people not. So basically this is, this is what creates and serves the social order that we live now. It's the self-esteem that makes you uh, feel ready to your role in the society. It's make you, make you accept from the inside your role and your place in the community. Um, and it's uh, catching very hard. If you look at any statistic around that, you're going to see that succeeding in school attached to money. Great neighborhood with lots of money have more percentage of kids that going to college. It surprise someone? No. And then we have Ivy, Ivy Leagues and private school that create these networks, and then everybody go and work for them. <laughs> this, is, this is the education system that we create. And I can speak about it. I taught like, uh, a yearly course around that, so I can speak about it forever. What is the alternative is more, more interesting because everywhere you go, you have this bell curve. So you, we, we cannot get out of this bell curve shape because, yeah, if, we, if all of us do the same thing and we measure ourselves with the same measurements do it, we're going to have bell curve even in this room. The only way to go around that is to change the way we measure. Think about the system that the goal of the system is to find your uniqueness, to find your specific strengths and passion, to find your own element. And teachers are going to be measured by that because good teacher today is a teacher that scores the kids with great, mediocre, failure. And you can bring other scores, the system is not going to get it, you're going to get it back. Even if you're a professor at UBC and if you the same, you have to send it like that, unless you're teaching a course fail or pass. This is what the system demands. So the only way to walk around it is to change the way that we work and, and to change collaboration under competition. And to say everyone is unique, and the, the goal of the community, education system if you want, is to help you to find how you can contribute in your best. And your role is to have great self-esteem, <laughs> to know what you're good at and to contribute back. And then we have a different ecosystem. So basically, the two narratives that we're fighting about around, uh, or we struggle around with the education system and the social infrastructure that we have is very clear ones. One is, Find a gap in the market, create value, and then create more and more and more and keep it for yourself. And as much as you have more, the community respect you more. So you need to have to sit on a mountain of value and then you get respect. And the other way to look at that is find your element, create value, and share it and how we can build different classroom with everybody know his own uniqueness, create value with own, his own uniqueness, and share it. It's very easy to think about like that when we think about musicians, like think about musicians that don't allow to share. It's craziness. But we build the economy that sharing is stupidness, and we appreciate and respect our heroes 
is people that kept their talent to themselves and they created value in a way that can count them for themselves. And it's okay. I don't blame anyone. I did it myself. But which culture we want, which economy we want, we want linked to which education system we want. But I want to go ahead time for questions from you guys. So we'll get there soon. I, I want to ask you uh, something that he um, really pushes in um, at Groundswell is, is diversity, and he's always talking about diversity. And, uh, so I want to ask him. Um, so what what does that mean? And you hear that word a lot these days. And, and why? Nope. And are those questions again? No. Um, so what does diversity mean to you and why is it so important in alternative education? Maybe I go with a story. It's okay, you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a very, uh, I, I established around 12 alternative schools that try to, to create the system. And while I did that, I took few mayors from Israel. In Israel, the mayor have a responsibility, share responsibility with the Minister of Education around the education system in the city. So I had a chance to take few mayors to see very unique schools in the States. One of them is really nice chain. It's not very radical, but they change something significant. And what they do, it's called High Tech High. It's a really weird name in San Diego. If you have a chance, it's a lovely place to see. And uh, I went with one of the Mary's a very hard politician. We get into a classroom in San Diego, and the first thing that he asked the students, like, who is the best student in the class? And their answer was, depending what. And when you got that answer, you understand that the system is different. In ITKI, they walk uh, around uh, uh, PBL, it's problem-based learning. So it's not frontal learning. And when you do a problem-based learning, it's like creating a project. So someone to great in the research, someone know to put the PowerPoint together, someone to build the model, someone, you know, it's like everybody has skills. And if in the 12 years of, or 13 years of schooling, you're doing projects all the time, people start to recognize what is your skill. So if you want the best designer, go with him. If you want the best, you know, one who want to talk about that, you want the great pitch, go with him. If you want the one who, you know, want to, uh, can, can, to make, can make the research and nail the thing down, go with him. So people start to build and they start in the beginning, they go with the group of friendships. Like, who is my friend? I'm going to do the project with him. And late into the game, they start to mix their talents and to create a better project. Uh, so I think this is a, it's a little story, but it shows something really, really, how, how you change infrastructure of people's mind, like what is the best student in the class, depending on what. And the same thing when you, when, when you come to create an alternative a, a business school, and you have in mind that what we need to do is to have the, the, the peer or the group. Federal government. And it's there to help um, economic development in Western Canada. So I took it to them and they looked at it and they said, Oh, you got way too many revenue streams. You're trying to do too much at the beginning. You need to chop a few things down. And and they, they made some other comments about it. But basically, I took a look at that business plan again and realized that it wasn't meeting my needs. The reason why I had a bunch of revenue stream, streams in there was because um, I, I, I wanted to, um, first of all, not be able to work too hard. right? <laughs> So I developed a bunch of revenue streams in order to make sure I had cash coming in. But at the same time, the reason why I didn't need much cash was the way I was structuring my business. Low overhead, um, minimal capital, startup costs, and all those types of things, right? Because I I'm also wanted to include my lifestyle in it. So what I, when I re-looked at my, my business plan, I was trying to put my lifestyle into that business plan. And, and, I, and I still kind of tried to force it, and it still wasn't going. And we, the other things went on that kind of made me reevaluate what I was trying to do. And, and um, I came to the conclusion that uh, the business plan wasn't the way I should be structuring this because I'm trying to fit a business into my lifestyle, right? What I was actually trying to do with my planning was take my lifestyle and trying to fit it into a business plan. And I wasn't working. 
So what I did was I developed a, a concept I called Respect for Life Development Plan. So it's about me and my lifestyle and how I wanted to live my life. I even created a vision, personal vision for myself. Right? And I got a personal, I got a business for the business, but I want my own personal vision of who I am and what I'm trying to accomplish. And so then what I ended up doing then is I, I built that plan and then I included my business plan within that. So the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in having needing to generate too much revenue is keeping my cost down because if my lifestyle is hunting, fishing, gardening, these other ways of supplementing my economic or sustenance needs. And so the wage economy only becomes part of it. You guys ever heard of the stereotype of the lazy Indian? I am. Yeah, so this, I, I was, this actually comes from where native people actually made, well, their, some anthropologists call them strategic economic decisions. Right? It only works so far, and then you get cash, you need enough cash to go buy some more um, bullets for your hunting, and then you, you leave that job and you go back to the main job that you were doing, hunting, fishing, trapping. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's where the, the stereotype I think came to. Plus, I got a few pretty lazy cousins. So you guys are out there, right? Um, so that's that's what I ended up doing is along that, and then also to mean limit the amount of cash that's needed and stuff like that. Instead of buying stuff, I would repair, refix. Um, I call the mall, or I call the the garbage dump in Dee Lake the mall. So I like to go up there and pick up stuff, right? Um, and so that becomes all part of, of what I'm trying to do with the cash component of it, and trying to bring my lifestyle into that. And so. Um, and that's one of the things that I teach the, the youth is, is this model that I have for respect for life and for them to develop uh, a sustainable, what, what I call it is sustainable livelihood. Yeah, 
thing. So one of the things that was really interesting for me is like, um, was just watching how I how I panic. You know, like what what happens to me? Where my mind goes? Um, because that would affect the way I managed my staff. It would affect the way I interacted with my clients. It would affect the way I dealt with a phone call from the dude who was asking for the GST. It, it, it would affect like all of this stuff, right? And, and then I, I would have to say like, oh my God, you know, what am I attracting here? You know, what what, is, what have I done? What am I creating? And then you, you would have to, uh, the only way you can fix that is to go back and say like, oh, how did I handle that situation? Or what, what was it about me that, you know, brought me to, into that place? Anyways, that's that's kind of my journey. It, it was cheaper than therapy, and <laughs> I don't know. I was, yeah. Anyways, it was interesting. It was like I got I got paid to go to therapy. <laughs>
that's what the product line is. Nobody could like understand that. And so nobody would give me any money and no one would fund me and to them I was a nut, right? But, um, but there was a reason and it was a different reason. But I'll tell you something, when I talked to other people who were running cleaning companies and they were complaining about the staff, no one would show up for their shifts, you know, it was so hard to recruit people, you couldn't get anyone decent. And I never, I would just sit silently while they were having these little bitchy conversations because that was not the experience I was having at all. So it was a, it was a you know, good trade-off, I thought. Maybe I, I can add on <clears throat> one, one sentence of remarkable perspective. I, I think we, it, it's become clear to more and more people that from the macro perspective, we, we need to change the balance between business and community. Like we need to change the balance between development and environment. It's had to be changed, it has to change. And the only way to change it is to change the measurement. Because the heroes that we create in this day is the is heroes that, you know, shifting or pushing the development, not consider the environment, or pushing business without considering community. And this is our heroes. And I think we have heroes here and a crisis there, and we're trying to put stuff together. And it it's will really have to be shifted if we want to change the stuff. And on top of that, we're living in an economy now that you know everybody everybody's young and understanding. Because people in my generation start to be a problem in, in, in a city like Vancouver. Because, you know, I, 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 I bought a property in the city. You know, we have people not to resign the job. We're staying in, in forever in the market. And young people don't have a space. Young people don't have jobs to find. So more and more people, more and more young people will figure that the economy is not working for them anymore. So then they need to create their own business, and business is like, ooh, ooh. But if you look at that, every corner store is a business. It's not for genius. It's not for someone who, every corner store is a business. And you don't have to create you know, something that change the world and, and uh, scale up and changing Europe in three days and change habits of everyone and all of this theory of change that became very popular in the in this world that you need to create the impact that if you're not changing England uh, and, and, and France in the next three years, it's, it's, it's not worth to invest in. I think investing and put energy in a local business that create uh, a value, uh, uh, a social value, a community value, and a capital value, it's a great thing to do. And it's, 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 it's not something that you, know, you need to be exceptional. Earlier, before I formally began, and you were just talking about statistics and using the language of, I guess, corporate business. Uh, and you did a survey, and you haven't mentioned it yet. So, could you please share that with us? With the fact that there's 11 social enterprises in the downtown east side that do employment services and across those 11 businesses, last year they created 1,500 jobs and did $8 billion in uh, sales. So if we took that and put that, because what happens in my world, they spend a lot of time doing policy work with government. And they always say, well, but the private sector creates jobs and, and drives the economy. And I say, well, but the social enterprise actually does more important stuff because not only do they drive the economy. And so that revenue economy. is being shared. But what, what we're doing, though, is we're requiring these, um, these companies to contract the services of our business. Right? So not only is the model of our business uh, indigenous, but also the, the approach that we're negotiating these agreements are, too. So we're having contributing to that shift, also. Okay. I had a question around um, the, the... We're talking about the Bell Curve model in education, and we're talking about uniqueness and measuring it differently. I think that may just be a bit of an incomplete argument because even if you're measuring uniqueness in some way, it's still going to lie on a bell curve. It's, it's like the number two, it has no connotation. So is it that the bell curve is the problem or is it the decision making around that bell curve the problem, the way we look at it? Uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, uh, my son plays basketball, uh, plays soccer. He would look at that as a ball that you said just here. You know. uh, 
I think the fact that we have endless bell curves, this is what makes the difference. Because if I need to put all of you on a one bell curve, it's like putting all of you in a pyramid chain. Let's see what happened, huh? A little will be up, all the rest gonna struggle, and some of us gonna be lying down on the floor, or in the street. If we shift this because we're struggling in this shape, like people are people, this is culture, culture is a shape. You create a shape, and you freeze it, and people are playing in this shape, and the shape creating us and our behavior. If you think about multiple Gauss, uh, Gauss is, it's in my own language, it's Greek, uh, the bell curve. And you think that in this room we have 100 bell curves. And each one need to find his own. The one that he is, you know, great in. And we have that. Out of school we have that sometimes. Like if you're a great chef, people respect you. Cooking in school is nice. If you're a fantastic musician, people respect you. A musician in school is like, go out of the class, you're making noise. So time not appreciate because we want to measure people in the same measure. So if you look at life and say, we have, we have, we have many talented. And the game is changing. It's not all of you on the one bell curve now. It's all of us trying to figure which one can lead but which other bell curve. And now we can create a picture that builds from our strengths. This is a very different game to play. And then you need to learn how to collaborate. Because in a one shape form, you have to fight for your place. Because if you want the fresh air up there in the pyramid, you need to learn to use your elbow very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand the system and walk the system out to get up. I did it myself. This is my life story. I came from a very poor neighborhood, you know, with a family that uh, all of them was Holocaust survivor. I had nothing. And I learned how to use my elbow very fast in the streets and after that in business. And, and then education came back to me and I had these opportunities. It actually changed my life. But this is the game. So how we structure the game and kids getting that so easy. So if you get that your place in the pyramid, you know, it's like, it's, it's me or you, so which choice I have? You step in on my face, or I step in your face, you know, I want to be kind, but if we compete in the pyramid, you know, it, I know it's easier to be. So, how we shape it differently, it's emphasize what skills we need and which skill we appreciate. So, collaboration is appreciate with everyone have acknowledged his, his uniqueness. And competition is appreciated if you need to get up on account of other people. So I, I think the, the problem isn't the bell curve, the problem is the, the use of the bell curve. Right? Um, it reminds me of this, this saying I found somewhere, I forget who, who said it, but he said the problem isn't the development of weapons, the problem is the spirit <laughs> of conquest. Right? So it's the same kind of thinking that I have. So one of the contracts that I have back home is, is to in incorporate tal knowledge and culture into the K-12 curriculum. And so right now, one of the things I'm doing is designing the next, year, next, year, next year's program and how that's going to integrate with what's going on in the classroom. And so one of the things that I'm looking at is um, the concept of um, why grade these kids to begin with. Either they know the skill, they can make a fire, or they can't, right? So that's the kind of thing that I have. And, and I tease these kids. I've been taking Teltan kids out in the bush for 30 years since I moved up there, right? Um, and I tell them it's a pass or fail thing. Right? You come out of the bush, you pass, and if you don't, you fail. <laughs> <laughs> but I think your number two is a really good example because it's all about this measurement, right? Because when I work with social enterprises, they, they say, I want to start a social enterprise. And people in the class know I personally says, why? And for some people say, I want to create two jobs. And for some people, that would be a huge success. For another person, creating two jobs would be a failure. So it's really like how we use the measurement and how we define success. Because you're right, number two doesn't mean anything until we qualify it, right? I mean, if you ask me to get up and like, <coughs> You know, talk about Jalad's bell curve. 
Don't ask me how to do music or any of that stuff, right? You know, Paul asked me to like write the sign for the street, and I said, I'm not going to embarrass myself and put my handwriting out in the public. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but that was the number two. I said, I don't have two. So we have to be really careful, I think, how we talk about this whole model of success. Because we have, and this is what we try to do with social enterprise, we've got to define success with what you're trying to achieve. Not by when somebody else comes along and says, this is a successful business. Because right? there's like at least five social enterprise catering companies in Vancouver. Would I ever try to compare them? Never. Because I would only compare them against what they're trying to achieve, not against each other. Because the, you know the Friendship Center catering company has a whole different purpose than Papa. Can they both succeed? Yes. Do they do the same thing? No, but they're both catering. Hmm. Sherry, I'm just curious about your views on the role of the state government in relation to the work that you're doing. And I mean, both in terms of like our educational system, and we have the BC government arguing currently we're moving towards more individualized curriculum programming. But of course, we can cut at the same time, and I don't see that happening with you know higher teacher speed ratios. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on like what the role and how you take some of the ideas that you're working with within the educational needs and educational programs. Maybe I'll stop there. I'm also curious about the state, though, in terms of the yeah, actual ads and what. I work in mental health, I used to work in mental health, and we, increasingly the state is using a corporate business model to organize how we manage public services. It's very hierarchical, top-down decision-making, and I'm just curious. What are your thoughts on that? Like, should we be moving those services into social enterprise and contracting, you know, like private public partnerships, but private social enterprise partnerships? And anyways, those are a few thoughts in that mind. There's a state for Only if we have people about, have passion for it. We have about a month to discuss that topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 I think it's a, it's a really important question, because, <laughs> and it does reflect for all of us, right? Because I deal with it because I do a lot of work with government all the time. And when I moved here to Canada, I couldn't figure it out, right? Because the nonprofit sector, every time I said, let's go do this, they would say, well, we have to go check with government. And I'd say, why? Because I came from the US, and government was usually the problem, <laughs> not the solution, right? And so I couldn't, it, and I still can't figure it out. Because I think the state here is a very paternalistic model. Yeah, and what we need to create is a balance between the role of state, which has a responsibility, the role of community, and the role of economy. And what we've gotten is way out of whack over who runs what and how decisions are made. Until we retrieve that balance between a shared goal and a co-creation of solutions, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get there. So the biggest thing for me is we, try to change the relationships as we try to solve the problems. And the measurements, too. Like I'm, I, I was asked to start a, women, a women's co-op in Cape Breton. It's you know economically depressed area. You know, please bring dusting divas in. And um, we, the, this group of women had gotten government funding to, to start this cooperative, this workers' co-op. But they didn't get to decide what to measure. They didn't get to decide um, what success looked like, and they didn't get to decide the, the pacing, they didn't get to decide their job descriptions, they did so it's like, what, what, like, it was just another kind of shitty program, right? So all the passion went out of it, and the only reason why social enterprise works is because of the passion of the people who are, because it aligns with their values and because it's, it's them. The economy. Yes, yeah. and the thing is, is government funding just sucks that right out. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and, it, yeah, exactly, because there was no conversation. The only time they wanted to hear from you is when your report was due, and if you didn't meet these objectives, they pulled your funding. So then it just created a culture of fear, and that's where they were working in, and there was no chance for it to be successful at all. So, 
in First Nations communities, that's one of the things that um, is happening. There's a lot of um, First Nations entities that are taking over a lot of the, the service delivery, right? And so there is a, a much clearer alignment with values of the First Nations community with the, the service delivery model that's being used and values with the clients that they're, they're serving. Um, the jury's still out on how successful that is. Um, but getting back to my own personal experience around government, I guide in places that the BC government considers protected areas like a park, ecological reserve, and I'm required to have a park use permit. And I haven't gotten one yet, so, and, and, I, and I won't get one. And they've asked me on two different occasions if I was getting a park use permit. So they, the, the government regulations have an impact on um, the way I conduct business or how I administer my business, but I'm not going to be getting a park use permit. Um, and the other thing I, I should mention about that I, that I thought was key and why I started my business as a tourism business, I wanted to show Teltan youth that they can do a, a, a tourism business within our territory and not be dependent on resource extraction industry. Right? And so that was the, one of the key things. Right? So I, when I'm in the classroom with those kids, I tell them, which one of you guys want to take over my business? Right? And, I'm, and I want to mentor them. Right? So, and, um, but that's, that's one of the main purposes of why I started that business. <coughs> For me, it's like, it's funny because we're using building structure from the 19th century, people from the 20th century, to teach the kids of the 21st century about the future. <laughs> and I, I, I find it hard to believe this concept is, is, is with government and without it going to be successful. And I, and, I, and I think one of the main, uh, especially when the future changes so fast, and I, I, I find it's hard that people, even if they change policies and stuff like that, can actually function in a way where they don't see the vision, when they don't see the alternative culture or some implementation of that. It's really hard to change systems like that. And I have to tell you that my, my last experience, like when I visit court is, uh, with my son lately, uh, I find a lot of alignments, uh, alignments between progressive education and First Nation culture as I exposed them with Cotis and his friend. And I, and, and I think that the main takeaway, it's, it was very influential on, on me and my perspective, like learning from First Nation on the land, uh, that how you can, and one of the, I think one of the main experiences that I had is a night of hunting with uh, someone and his son. And the talks that I had with them, it took me out of my safe zone. Look at me, I'm not a hunter, I'm a city fed guy. But, you know, like stuff in place. And don't forget the rainstorm. Yeah, the rainstorm. And it was really, really uh, out of my safe zone. But the talks, uh, and you know, when you're, when you're speaking 17 years old, and you have enough time to speak with him, you cannot lie to you too much. And you, what I got from that, that the way that you can get respect, if you create value and share it. So when you share the value that you create, it gives you respect in the community. And I think uh, if, we, if we can turn policies, if we can find that kind of culture's influence on the systems that we have, on schools, because you know when, when schools start to be more and more progressive, a lot of parents standing on, the, on, the, on, on their feet and say, oh, oh, don't do that. It's like my kids now uh, learning in, in normal roles. It's a public school and, and UBC. And it's far, fairly progressive. It's very different than the other uh, school system here. And they struggle with the parents, tons, because the parents want the kids to learn like everybody else. Because the heroes are the people who make, you know, create value and keep it to themselves. So they need to learn the, the value of competition and not collaboration. And you see that in the argument. So I, I think in, 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 in this place, on, on this geographic, learning from First Nation culture can be very inspiring. Inspiring for the system that we have in here.
the man generation, like, sometimes they're conflicted, like we want more meaning, but at the same time, there are still a number of things that we want sort of from the old system, not like the security of maybe like benefits or like healthcare and like that kind of things. And maybe the, the new economy, or like creating your own job, or like creating your own business, it might be difficult for like youth or like my generation to like cope with that. How do you support um, us basically to sort of cope with either the choice of do I go for a security path and like going for like, a job, the old system, or do I go for creating a business, which means that we might not have benefits in like, the ourselves. So the, the, it's like sort of insecurity that comes with that, um, with a decision. How do you support like, us with that? <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't think there's an answer, Chris, because because I think those are personal decisions, right? I mean, I work with lots of young entrepreneurs who have all kinds, and that's part of like why the whole Groundswell program and we've gone through it, and you know, uh, others who live and others who are here. It's really about giving people the space to try to figure that out, right? Because it's like when the fishing industry collapsed here. Um, 15 years ago, and all the fishing companies were saying, that's it, there's no more fish, we're getting rid of the boats, you're all laid off. And the union turned to all the fishermen and said, hey, we got a good deal, we'll give you a loan, you can have your own boat. And you can be your own boss. And the fisher guys looked at him and said, I'm a fisher guy, I'm not a manager. And I don't want to manage people, I want to be home on Friday night at 5 o'clock, I want to spend time with my kids. Don't tell me to be a manager and run a business. I don't think there's an answer, they're saying, because some people aren't comfortable with risk. Some people are. I mean, I was involved in a social enterprise, and we thought our nonprofit had borrowed $200,000 to buy a restaurant to start a social enterprise. The bank called us the next day and said, oh, we made a mistake. We don't loan to nonprofits, only to individuals. We looked at each other and said, and this is a long time ago, $200,000 was like be buying the Taj Mahal today. Um, we weren't very comfortable with that, but we, we did it because there was a value. So I don't think, Chris, there's an answer. I think that's something that people explore. And, and I think the part of the problem is, though, until we create a better system that provides benefits for people who want to take risk, we're caught in that dichotomy of you do this or you do that. The best training is just get fired a whole bunch of times. <laughs> and then you sort of realize, ah, you know, you can figure it out. With, 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 me, with me personally, it's, um, it is about risk, right? And it's about each individual person's tolerance to risk. With me, it was um, my passion and my uh, pursuit of passion and freedom outweighed the issues of security. Now, I'm also a status Indian, and we do have um, what is called uninsured health benefits. And it's named uninsured health benefits for a reason. But we do have access to some of Canada's um, health services. Right? And so I had a bit of that to fall back on, too. But my goal in, in, in the future is to create my own um, uh, benefits package. Right? So, and, I'm, I'm looking at creative ways and how to do that. The only problem is he's 25 hours away from the health services. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, got a, we got a diagnostic center in Detroit. There's your help. I will just look at it from this perspective. I think sometimes we confuse ourselves and we, we think that the fact that we don't know make it safe for us. Like I was a director of an uh, old factory when I was 24. Someone let me try something there and I took a four million dollars loan to bring big machine from Detroit that I never been there. Uh, it, it was successfully bad. Success bad. <laughs> but it was eighty five employees in this factory that felt very safe with the paycheck when the CEO you know, when the director played this little game. Uh, that happened to be successful <laughs> but you know it's like nothing is safe. Like we, we we live in you know we live in an environment that we believe that it's safe. We so far from that. Or oh, sickness is not around us. We we become so comfortable with with this fake of 
you know, all of, lots of stuff, like we drinking sugar without sugar, coffee without coffee, uh, wheat without wheat, all of this stuff start to confuse us. And I don't, I don't think it's something is safe. I think we live, you know, in the nature, you understand that success is go out in the bush and failure is not. It's like that, we expose, all of us expose all the time. And it's, uh, sometimes it's about the, the risk tolerance that you have, and sometimes it's just about awareness. Government cut out, big companies fail, hotels have problem with BNB, BNB, you know, the, the drivers think that uh, the main uh, issue is the, is the privately owned uh, uh, replacement taxi company, but in two years it's going to drive by itself. And for our kids, uh, driving is going to be like an exclusive sport for rich kids that actually drive a car. <laughs> it's, it's changing really, really fast. A lot of industries that feel very safe. How many people you know, make the paycheck as driver and feel very safe? I don't think they're safe in the next five years. I don't think they're safe at all. So it's awareness, it's risk tolerance, it's how much you're willing, from my perspective, is to write your own story. And it always is like struggle with the pen. And our culture offers you to write your story for you. And you actually need to resist that. You actually need to take the pen and to work, you know, to write your own story there. It's not have to be your own business. But your own story is like, we, we have path. What is your career? What are you doing? We have this qui critical question on paths that guide us. And if you sit still and do what you ask, it's going to guide you to a safe place. We have time for one more question. I just want to add a comment um, to that sort of being like similar to Chris. And I really, and working in Groundswell, it's like we are in a time of major transition that's happening very fast. Technology is happening faster. And things are tough, and we haven't, like, we don't have a map for where we're at right now. And that's how, that's how I feel. And I think we're going to try a lot of things. We're going to fail a lot. But I do see these kernels emerging of people getting together in creative ways to share services, get access to services in, in co-ops. And, and I know a friend of mine who are struggling with the state, whether that's local government or, or higher up, um, to challenge what's happening. And I'm seeing the state, the, the credit unions, the banks, realize that, well, you're right. This isn't, it's like, you have no choice. We have, we have to make some changes. So it's, I feel like it's starting. I just want to like, it's hard. Like, it's going to be hard for everyone in this room. But it's, we're in this like high speed evolution where we don't know where we're going. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. Lots of them. And one more question. Yeah. Um, so I work with youth a lot, specifically in the energy industry, so if you're in the oil, um, and a lot of what I do is convince youth that they have value and that their ideas have value in who are the entrepreneurs themselves. But then at the same time, occasionally I run into this block of after I convince someone that they have value that they don't share anymore because it's like, it's like I'll be like, oh, I have value of course. <laughs> like I'm not sharing. Um, and so have you ever run up against that dichotomy in exploring social entrepreneurship and how have you gotten past the idea that just because we're valuable or just because you've you know, shown somebody how they have value doesn't mean that they shouldn't share that value or be part of a wider network of collaboration. We have a very intensive uh, recruitment uh, <laughs> intake, <laughs> interviews. We need those people out. <laughs> I'm, half, I'm like half -trip. I feel you. I, I feel. I feel that pain because, like, I, I used to. I had it in my head, like, okay, so, uh, so I'm investing you. Like, you, you're coming in, and you know, you've got some challenges, and I'm going to be super patient. I'm going to invest in you, and you're going to move through, and then I'm going to get you to this place where, you, you know, you can really, you can take on this job. You can take on this job. You can do. And they're like, actually, no. I, I want to go and start a competitive cleaning company now, and I, and I actually want to like take up half your staff. But I actually had to go through a process, and this is one of the things that I had to like look at myself around. You have to let them go. They're autonomous, you know, and that's part of having value, right? Is that you're an autonomous individual, and um, hopefully, you know, your ethics and your morals, like, say, you know, have gratitude to the people who helped you 
find your value and to develop it, but you can't control it. And you, you sort of have to like, okay. You'll be hearing from my lawyer. And I think it's, I mean, and it's also, sorry, just to clarify, it's more sharing with each other. Oh, exactly. Oh, I thought you meant like just leaving. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Oh. Or, I mean, that's also, that's also nice. Yeah, so describe it, but describe it a little bit. So more. I, I work on a charm in the music and the for sustainable and reduced transition specifically. Um, and the idea of intergenerational collaboration. But then often, like, sometimes you get great ideas or spread them out, but then they, once they've done that, they don't want to mentor other youth or they don't want to collaborate with other youth or share their events and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Right? And the, the example is with my grandmother. Like she, she caught, a, she taught, taught a couple of women in our community how to how to tan moose hides. And one of the the women that she taught continues to teach other people how to tan moose hides. And she's continuing, and she's sharing the moose hides that she. Um, that she tans and stuff like that, right? The other woman that she, she taught doesn't do that, right? And so um, in our culture, it just, that, that other woman who didn't do that just lost a lot of respect. And respect in our community is currency. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that's one of the things. So I, I also have the same issue with, with some of the students. And it's just a matter of what I end up doing is I just keep, um, telling the stories, our, our creation stories, and our stories about respect, and, and having uh, much more specific conversations around the concept of respect um, in the group discussions after the story, particularly using um, incidents that would have happened while we're out in the bush with the kids. Um, other things, when, when you first asked your question, what went into my mind first is that I, I take youth out in the bush and try to get them to um, address the, the trauma that, that's happened in their life and how they're acting out and, and addressing that trauma today, right? And so one of the ways is, is taking out, being out on, in a risky environment like being in the bush is one way of getting rid of that residual trauma without having to revisit. So that's one of the reasons.